Uh, first, welcome everybody to our second Faith the Forest education, educational Zoom event. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Laurel Van Ham, my co-chair, and we'll be hosting our presentation. And I'm Laurie Benson, uh, also one of the co-chairs of Faith the Forest. A special welcome this evening to the members of the Wachiska Audubon Society who are joining us this evening as part of their regular monthly meeting. Uh, and a reminder to the Wachiska members to stay on at the end of uh, Justin's presentation for a brief Wachiska meeting um, when we close the Faith the Forest presentation. You won't have to do anything, just, just don't leave the Zoom. Um, this evening, we're honored to have Justin Everson with the Nebraska Forest Service and Nebraska Statewide Arboretum presenting Trees, Our Superhero Friends. Justin is the Green Infrastructure Coordinator for the Community Landscapes and Forest Health Bureau of the Nebraska Forest Service, where he oversees programs that provide funding, technical assistance, and educational outreach for sustainable landscapes and communities. He grew up on a farm in Western Kimball County in Nebraska, where he learned an appreciation for short grass prairie and Nebraska's wide open spaces. Yeah. Justin went to UNL where he earned degrees in architecture and community and regional planning. He is passionate about trees, native landscapes, biodiversity, and sustainable landscape development. Uh, now, Justin uh, thinks he's gonna have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Uh, so if you have questions as we're going along and would like to put those in the chat, that would be great. And uh, we may, uh, hopefully we'll get at least to those. Um, so for now, uh, if you will please uh, join me. Oh, well, one housekeeping thing. Um, now that we've had a chance to all wave and see people's faces, if you will turn your cameras back off and, and be sure your microphones are muted, that would be great. And uh, now we'll welcome Justin. It's all yours, Justin. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. That was awesome. I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, I grew up out in Prairie Country, Kimball County, Shortgrass Prairie. It was hard to get a tree to grow out on our farm, I'll tell you that. But um, uh, we actually lived in town and you could really feel the effect of trees, the value of trees and blocking wind out there in Kimball County uh, when you went into town. And so I think that was one of my first early appreciations of trees. And then going to school at UNL in Lincoln, I was amazed at how big the trees got there. <laughs> so. Uh, I've been fascinated by trees all the way along, and I'm actually in Tennessee this week. My wife and I travel to Tennessee quite a bit, the Smoky Mountain areas. I'm in Pigeon Forge, the home of Dollywood. Uh, Dollywood's right across the street from where I'm at tonight, so um, if you hear any of that good old country music playing, that might be coming from Dollywood. They're kind of closed down this time of year. We had a Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. I hope I wasn't uh, blabbing on and on without you hearing me. But uh, anyhow, I'm out here in Tennessee. So the trees grow fast, they grow big. And we'd like the Smoky Mountains partly because you get to see these old growth forests tucked into these coves uh, with tulip poplars, you know, that are uh, 30 foot around and maybe 150 feet tall. Most of the good trees were logged long ago, but there's still a lot of good trees out here. And our little two acres of cabin ground, I counted it the other day, up to about 20 species of trees and shrubs out there. I like to poke around. Uh, I was bringing my list to me just the other day. Hickories, tulip trees, sweet gum, flowering dogwood, uh, chestnut oak, scarlet oak, a couple different pines, eastern hemlock. Fraser Magnolia, some birches. It's really neat. We're going to put a little nature trail around the cabin for people that rent it. And then one of my frustrations is on the lane going up to the cabin and even around the cabin itself, what did they landscape with? Plants from China. <laughs> They've got all these wonderful native plants out here and then they uh, landscape with plants from China. And you may have heard that uh, calorie pear tree is exploding across the United States. 
kind of taking over certain areas that's happening in Lincoln and Omaha, and it's really bad out here. So to see that happening right around our cabin is pretty frustrating. Anyhow, enough about my cabin. I hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, trees are superhero friends. I did not come up with that title. That was uh, Lori's idea. I think that's right on target. I love trees and I think they do act as superheroes in our lives. And we're gonna talk about that. What I really hope to do is maybe blab on here for about a half an hour with my views about um, kind of where we find ourselves environmentally and ecologically across the globe and then bring that into trees and the value of trees. Because uh, yes, we definitely want to tie this into climate change. Uh, there are pros and cons, good and bad, about trees related to climate change, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, so yeah, I was going to throw up these funny little slides just, just quickly so that you could uh, have something to chew on while I talked about myself and our cabin. I should have done that sooner, but pardon the pun. Let's have fun. You know, when we're talking about trees, we certainly want to take things seriously. But if you're not having fun planting trees and playing with trees and caring for trees, I think we're doing it wrong, right? So uh, that's the way I look at it. Is my, uh, can you see myself on the screen too? Is that a bother, Lori? We're used to it. Um, sure. You know, that's, that's a choice. That's a, that's a setting in Zoom. So if people don't want to um, see that, uh, just change your view up in the right hand yeah, corner. Hide that thumbnail video. Okay. Did that hide it? Um, it, it? It hides it on your screen, but not mine. And we want oh. that for our recording, Justin. So it's just fine. Okay. I'll leave it like that. I hope it's not in the way. Anyhow, let's talk trees for a little bit. And then a relationship to the broader challenges facing us across the globe in what I call the biosphere or scientists call the biosphere. Are we really doing our best for this little skin of life on our globe? Uh, we humans, you know, have been around here for a couple hundred thousand years or so, but it's only in the last 10 to 15,000 years that we've kind of exploded across the planet with our technology and agriculture allowing us to do that. And boy, have we really changed uh, the way this biosphere functions. And uh, we got to look at these challenges, a rapidly changing climate for sure, habitat loss, decreased biodiversity. This is what's going on globally. Uh, increasing extinction rates, degraded soils, water issues across the world. Ocean acidification is one of the big things that they think will really drive climate change. Uh, population growth, and then just our human apathy and our disconnect from nature. There's no, no two ways around it. We humans impact the globe uh, very um, prominently. We don't have to say it's all bad, but we can most definitely say some of it is a negative uh, outcome for our future. So let's look at this. The two big concerns to me, of course, number one, a changing climate. It's real, folks. Our trees are telling this, this for sure, and so are a lot of other things. How will it change and what can we do about it? That's the big question. And then loss of habitat. This is the big one that gets to me, really, right along with uh, changing climate. If you read the World Wildlife Fund Living, Living Planet Report, they always talk about the decline in vertebrate species populations. Just since 1970, it's an over 50% decline just in the number of vertebrate animals on this globe. That's human impact. Uh, we're driving that. So what does that mean? You know, it's uh, going to have a consequence for how we li live our lives, and it should. I like to read some authors that uh, delve into our impact on, on nature. And here's one, Wendell Berry. We have lived our lives by the assumption that what was good for us would be good for the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And then another one, we don't hear from Lady Bird Johnson too much anymore. There's kind of an old school environmentalist, one of the first coming out of the 60s. And she said, some may wonder why I chose wildflowers when there's hunger and unemployment and the big bomb in the world. 
Well, I for one think we will survive and I hope that along the way we can keep alive our experience with the flowering earth for the bounty of nature is also one of the deep needs of man. How about John Muir? Uh, he was one of the leading proponents of setting aside national parks like the Smoky Mountains right here where I'm at. If we didn't have John Muir and other people like him, we probably wouldn't have set aside national parks. And he would climb a tree in a storm just to feel what it was like. This guy was crazy. He said, so extraordinary is nature with her choicest treasure, spending plant beauty as she spends sunshine, pouring it forth into land and sea, garden and desert. And so the beauty of lilies fall on angels and men, bears and squirrels, wolves and sheep, birds and bees. And then this old uh, Native American proverb, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. So all of that leads me to say, you know, it's an, a really a moral imperative now. It's the moral challenge of our time that we develop and promote a new ethic for how we treat this planet and how we sustain our species in a meaningful way. We are all in this together. So it also means how we treat each other. That's one of the big challenges we're bumping up into right now. Now, human nature versus mother nature. Here are just a few personal thoughts, I would say. Feeling guilty isn't going to help. Yeah, we humans have caused this, but you know, hey, every animal exploits their environment for survival and comfort. We're no different. Let's not feel guilty about that. We humans have the unique perspective from our thinking brains that we understand our consequences or we can to a certain extent. That's the only thing that separates us from the other animals. I'd rather be a human than a bear or an opossum or a fish. <laughs> so I'm not gonna feel guilty for being human, but we most definitely should take stock in what we're doing. We've become disconnected from nature and we've caused a lot of harm to the biosphere, no two ways around it. But think about this, what a smart and capable species we are. There are over 7 billion of us on the globe now and our ingenuity, the way we get things done is just incredible to think about. Uh, it got us into this mess, but it can also get us out. We invented agriculture reading, science, literature, music, and art. We put men on the moon, science, and all that it does for us, modern medicine. We can do this if we put our minds to it. I have, I have full faith in that. <coughs> but we have to accept facts and work together. And I can't remember what that said. Yeah, tree planting and care is part of that for sure. Hero. I'm not seeing what this uh, part of the screen says, so I'm gonna try and move that. Well, anyhow, a, he a hero is someone or something with distinguished courage or ability admired for their brave deeds and noble qualities. And I do think trees, even though <laughs> they're not a human, trees can also be called superheroes, Laura, and I'm glad you came up with that title. Think of all the things that these uh, superheroes do for us in our lives. Comfort. Here's the big one for those of us in Nebraska and the Midwest and the Great Plains. Cooling shade in the summer and then wind protection in the winter. Those two things are amazing. Energy conservation and then the cost savings from that are incredible. That's really going to have one of the biggest impacts on tree planting to benefit climate change is reducing our energy consumption. Property values are increased. Community vitality is improved. The trees sequester carbon. They help with stormwater management. They're important for wildlife habitat. They're definitely better for our health, including our mental health. And then they provide food for people and wildlife, lumber and other products. And holy cow, trees are just beautiful. They're an aesthetically beautiful organism that we just want to have as, around us, I think, for the beauty they provide. Here's what one, the value of one well-placed tree. This is a catalpa tree. I use this slide a lot. This is a catalpa out in Cozad, right in the middle of Nebraska. Is Cozad middle Nebraska? I think it is, the 100th meridian, right? So one tree, well-placed tree here, cooler 
uh, summer shade on the southwest corner of that house, shading that house just right in the exact right spot. 10% energy savings up to $75 per year. It captures 1,200 gallons of storm water, preventing that from running off into the sewer system. It can capture 575 pounds of CO2 in a year. And then the wildlife, if you've seen a catalpa tree in bloom, it's buzzing with bees and other insects. And then the birds are coming to feed on those. It's amazing. Catalpas are great trees for kids to climb. And then there's a beauty of, and a lifetime of pleasure from one well-placed tree. Superheroes indeed. Uh, I have a handout for you that I will send anybody who wants it after the program. Just let me know but all the benefits of trees that we calculate and keep, keep in one document. But here are some other links and Lori will share, we will share you these links about the benefits of trees. Get online, you'll find all kinds of benefits, but these are some of the better ones, including the Arbor Day Foundation. <coughs> now, can you imagine coming out to Nebraska or the Great Plains at the time of settlement 150 years ago or so there were not many trees out here. And I think people, what were they thinking? I don't know why. I don't know why they came to Nebraska, especially Kimball County, um, but they did. I'm glad they did or I wouldn't be here. And what's one of the first things they started to do was plant trees because they came from where trees were at. They felt the benefit of trees and then trees got planted in communities all across Nebraska. Just look out from the Nebraska State Capitol in the 1860s or maybe 1870 or so. Uh, it's a treeless plain, isn't it? Nothing out there. Well, here's the trees now. In 2010, you look across Lincoln from the, the modern day capital, and it's a community forest. The value of those trees is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm guessing, if not billions, just for Lincoln. So those are the values of trees. Uh, we can wrap our head around them, we can celebrate them, and we should, but unfortunately, all is not well for our trees. These are the big challenges we're facing in Nebraska, but some of this goes across the globe. Climate and weather is a big one. Insects and diseases are happening all the time, exacerbated by cl changing climate. Invasive species like emerald ash borer is gonna lay, lay waste to almost all of our ash trees in Nebraska in the coming years. Our community forests are uh, aging and shrinking around us. More trees go out than go in. There's a lack of species diversity. Lawn care impacts have a huge impact on our trees. Herbicide damage from both lawn related things and agriculture are really an upticking problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Nursery issues, urban challenges, and then human neglect and apathy. Our trees really are counting on us to do better uh, for them, and we just don't do it very uh, well all the time. Here's climate. Climate, of course, is an impact. Uh, drought, floods, wind, hail, tornadoes, ice storms, temperature swings. If you're in the Great Plains, we get it all from 30 below zero one year to 115 above the next. Uh, tornadoes now in December, uh, you name it, trees really have a lot to overcome. Invasive insects and diseases. These are just some of them that are laying waste to our trees around us right now. Uh, we had oak pine wilt disease come through a few years ago, wiped out millions of Scotch pine and Austrian pine. And now emerald ash borer is coming. And now this uh, problem called bur oak blight is taking out some of our most important older bur oak trees. So that's no good. Of course, urban challenges, we plant trees, we need trees to do well in our communities. Uh, but wow, uh, these, <laughs> look at what we're up against here with some of our trees in our urban situations. This is something I regularly rail against is our impact to trees from lawn care. We humans love a neat and tidy look in our communities. I don't fault people for that, but boy, do are we anal about it. And we put millions and millions of dollars into caring for the lawn and when we're happy to let some of our trees die around us. Uh, so overwatering, lawnmower damage, herbicide issues, all kinds of things are a challenge in lawn care to our trees. 
we are slowly losing these big trees in our communities, 30 to 50% canopy loss in most Nebraska communities in our older neighborhoods uh, is pretty average, not unheard of at all. It's happening in Lincoln at an alarming rate too. <coughs> Excuse me. Species diversity, we need to keep improving our species diversity. Uh, the tree that we hung our hat on for the first 70 to 80 years of Nebraska's existence was the American elm until Dutch elm disease came along and wiped them out. And then what did we replant with? A lot of green ash. I don't know if you can see my, let's see if I can see my pointer here. Right here. Yeah, can you see that? This is uh, East Avon, Meadowdale Drive area in East Lincoln. All of these, I'd say 80% of these trees in this picture are ash and they are going away. They're gonna be gone in the next 10 to 15 years. Isn't that sad? So we've got to do better by that. Hopefully I can keep advancing my slides. Okay, here we go. And then apathy. Here is one old American elm uh, in Havelock area of Northeast Lincoln. It stood on this uh, intersection for probably well over a hundred years shading that little house. But new um, owners came along in the last couple of years and that tree went away. There it is, it sh shaded that intersection for over a hundred years. It survived the 1930s, it survived Dutch elm disease, but it didn't survive new owners. And I don't know what you tell somebody uh, when they move into a house like that and they take that tree down. The tree was bigger than the house. <laughs> and holy cow, you talk about change in, uh, in energy use to keep your house cool. Wow, there's a perfect example. So of course we should plant trees, of course we should. This is a no brainer. Trees are gonna be good for us. The World Economic Forum's One Trillion Trees Initiative came along a few years ago. President Trump signed up America to this and it really does sound good on the surface of it. There was science talking about, let's just add a trillion trees, more or less plant trees wherever we can, which makes some sense. But when you look at it a little closer, the science is not quite so clear on this. There are pros and cons of planting trees uh, across the globe. And here are a few studies you might wanna link to. Again, you'll get these links uh, when, with the saved PowerPoint. We'll have a place for you to download it. But uh, there are all kinds of uh, research and opinion pieces now about how we should do tree planting. We can't just plant trees willy nilly. We have to do it right. So here's what science is telling us. Yes, over 50% of global forests have been lost to human activity in the last 10,000 years or so. 50% of global forests are gone. Trees can absorb and store a lot of carbon, estimated at 50% of dry weight. Think about the General Sherman, a giant sequoia uh, in California that weighs 4.1 million pounds. <laughs> That's 2 million pounds of carbon. Tree planting, when properly done, can help address climate change, but it's not that simple. It takes time. Where will trees be planted? What species are going to be grown? How will they be managed? How do they interact with the local ecology? Some planting could actually make things worse, such as planting in the Arctic. Uh, green trees in the Arctic will absorb more sun and more energy and actually warm the Arctic faster. Many forests are now burning, releasing lots of carbon dioxide. NASA estimates that 15 to 20% of carbon emissions each year come from deforestation. We just have to hold on to these old growth forests, especially tropical forests, wherever we have them. They are the carbon sinks that do the most good for us. And then finally, in many places such as Nebraska, Grasslands are actually likely the better carbon sinks than forests due to the threat of fire and drought. We are a prairie country. And yes, we have room for a lot of trees. Cedars are coming whether we want them or not, but let's hold on to our prairie too, because it's also a good carbon sink when we manage it properly. So what we can say, tree, we, what we can't say, our trees are an unmitigated good and we should just plant the heck out of them. But what we can say, trees offer many social and environmental benefits 
and we should preserve them and plant many more of them where they make sense. Trees do capture and store carbon. Trees help cool us in the summer and help reduce energy consumption. Trees provide wildlife habitat and aid biodiversity. Trees offer emotional and spiritual connections to the natural world. Trees are certainly superheroes. So how can we do better? And I will try to go through this fairly quickly. I've blabbed on pretty long here and I wanna speed this up so that we can get to the end for some questions. But some of the things we have to do better, it starts with good nursery stock. I can't uh, um, kind of point this out strongly enough. Be careful if you're buying your trees from the box store. They don't know what's coming. <laughs> through the store or whether it's most appropriate for your part of the world. Buy your trees from locally uh, mom and pop or, or established nurseries that know what they're doing, that are proud of their stock. This is really critically important. This person on the right is Jim Cluck. He was a nurseryman from Schuyler who just poured his love of trees into his business. He spread them all across Nebraska. He used gravel beds to grow trees. What a wonderful person who left us way too uh, soon in a car accident over 10 years ago. Uh, but man, was he a great nurseryman. If you could have bought a tree from Jim Cluck, you would have had a really phenomenal tree. There are different options for buying trees, bare root, containerized, bald and burlap and speg dug, but most trees are sold in containers. Just be aware that containers have problems. If, you're not, if they're not watched carefully, tr container trees have circling roots. Ideally, we want our roots to be fibrous and laterally spreading. So that's really important to get right. Thankfully, we have nurseries uh, figuring this out. Uh, this is a tree that's grown by Great Plains Nursery north of Lincoln uh, using grow bags. And they're figuring out a system that really gets us better trees. When we plant trees, we've got to do it right. I'm not going to get into this in great detail. You've got upcoming speakers in this series that are going to talk about tree selection and proper planting, but we've got to get the depth right. We've got to handle the roots right and really take time. I've heard it say, you know, let's dig a hundred dollar hole as well as for that hundred dollar tree because the hole is pretty darn important. It's not rocket science. If Justin Evertson can figure it out, anybody can. But we get a lot of this wrong and we shortchange our trees when we're in a hurry. I would say good design and placement are pretty important. Don't scatter trees. Look how trees grow in nature. They grow close together. They do that for a reason because they help each other out. Separate trees from high maintenance turf zones wherever we can. And don't plant one of everything, but strive for a diversity, uh, a meaningful diversity, if that makes sense to you. You may have heard about the wood wide web. This is the whole concept of the value of soil, uh, organic soil, and how important mycorrhiza fungi and fungi associates are to trees. Trees literally in the forest communicate with each other via these fungal pathways. It's really uh, phenomenal. Science is figuring this out. Uh, they can send chemical signals from one tree to another because of these uh, fungal pathways. Uh, what does that mean totally? We don't know exactly, but we do know that it's very beneficial to forest trees. And if we can mimic that a little bit in our community trees, our community trees would be better. So try to mimic forest soils. Those are rich organic soils where nutrients are recycled. We put down mulch, we leave the leaf litter. Uh, we're not anal about picking everything up and our trees will really appreciate that if we do some of that. Here's how we often do it in our communities. That poor tree has to exist kind of as a soldier uh, battling against all our lawn inclinations and you wonder why trees struggle in environments like this sometimes. I can't read the top of my screen so, but I will say how do we create biodiverse and resilient community forests? that balance tree adaptability with uh, ecological outcomes. Those are the things we gotta strive for. Uh, species diversity, adaptability to urban conditions. We need to think about native versus non-native trees, disease and insect resistance, tree availability, insect and pollinator health, and then invasive species. 
one of the things I will go to my grave um, drumming for is the idea that we've got to plant more of our regionally native species. In our communities, it's hard to use only native trees, but we have to quit using invasive species and we have to use more well-behaved natives for sure. And if you ever read anything by Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home was his first book. Nature's Best Hope was a, a more recent one. And then The Nature of Oaks, take some time and read those books and you'll understand how important native trees and native plants in general are to sustaining uh, ecological biodiversity, not just in birds, but in insects, other creatures. It really is incredible. Oaks are at the top of the list, but willow, cherry, cottonwood, crabapple, elm, hickory, all of our native trees do a lot of good for us. And then look at ornamental pear or ginkgo. They sustain zero uh, native lepidopter species. So, uh, and remember that so many of our overwintering birds are eating caterpillars off these trees in the winter, believe it or not. So um, definitely plant more of our native trees. When you plant native trees, you get native wildlife. I love some of these bird species I see in my backyard. Uh, last week I was watching the brown creeper uh, go up the tree and the nuthatch came down and the, they just passed each other on their way to the suet feeder. A lot of fun to watch these backyard, uh, backyard relatives of the dinosaurs. So what is native? One thing to think about is think regionally native because uh, trees and ecosystems do not care about state boundaries. It doesn't matter what's native to a particular state. It matters what's native to a particular eco region. And if we look across Nebraska and the Midwest, we scatter our, or we cast our net out a couple hundred miles. We can really bring into our uh, utilization a lot of regionally native species that are fun to use. So let's keep that in mind. Trees have been coming and going in our part of the world for eons, especially since the retreat of the last Ice Age glaciers. So remnant native woodlands tell us about climate changes that push trees in and out of the region for eons. And we can claim these trees as being native, even if they're not here right now. They might be native to Kansas or Colorado or South Dakota, but they probably used to be native to Nebraska. Ice Age plant and animal fossils, this is a study that came out of the University of Kansas, and it looked at Ice Age fossils out in Western Nebraska. Macro fossils of white and blue spruce and limber pine indicate a taiga-like successional mix of coniferous forest uh, many years ago in Nebraska. So, and we can call these species native. I hope that makes sense to you. But these rem remnant tree populations are really fascinating to look at and learn from. Here we have Burrow Canyon out in southwestern Nebraska, out in Hitchcock County, if any of you have been out there, southwest of McCook. McCook. What a great place to explore bur oak trees. This is Hackberry Hollow out in Cheyenne County. Hackberries have been on the Great Plains literally for millions of years. And some of these trees have been in these hollows for hundreds of thousands of years. So just to think about how tough and adaptable they are is just fascinating to me. Out in my home country of Kimball County, far Western Kimball County, there are remnant uh, limber pine trees that shouldn't be there. <laughs> They're at a lower elevation than they typically are in the mountains. Why are they there? It's because the ice ages pushed them there uh, 15,000 years ago and they are still there. That's just pretty incredible to me. Those are tough trees. Nebraska sits at an ecological crossroads really where east meets west and north meets south. More species reach their range limits in Nebraska than in any other state in the country. That's pretty incredible. That tells us that we really have a pretty good geographic gene pool to draw from for our native species, northern species, western species, eastern species, and now species that are mostly in Kansas or Oklahoma. And when we think about climate changing, we better look south to Kansas and Oklahoma uh, and think about pulling trees uh, up to our part of the world from that, those native spots, if that makes sense to you. 
where I work, the Nebraska Forest Service, in partnership with the green industry, are identifying and propagating as many of these trees as we can to trial across Nebraska to continue to try and figure out maybe what are going to be the trees of our future. Yeah. It takes time. It's not easy to figure out, but we're working on it. We're doing the best we can. The good thing is that we know we have genetic capacity in most of our regionally native species already. Probably 30 species of oaks will grow in Nebraska, and we grow maybe five different types of any abundance. Southeast Nebraska is where we have this remnant of the eastern deciduous forest kind of reach its western limit. What a beautiful part of Nebraska. Oaks, hickories, pawpaw, ironwood, basswood. It reminds me of Tennessee. Then there are these remnant populations that tell us that trees were here from other times, limber pine, bur oak, a relic oak from the Great Plains nursery growing from Burr Oak Canyon. We are looking south at Kansas and Oklahoma uh, for species down there, a couple species that will really be good in terms of future utilization for Nebraska, uh, I would say would be Schumard oak and then pecan. Both of those species are native to Oklahoma and Kansas, and they are drought tolerant, heat tolerant, soil tolerant, and we're going to plant a lot more of them going forward. In southeast Colorado, there's the Cottonwood Creek Canyon area with a really cool mix of oak species and other species hybridized uh, uh, hackberries. And we're gonna go out there and try to collect seeds from those canyon areas and, and utilize them more in Western and Southwest Nebraska. And then our communities are loaded with urban survivors, trees that have stood the test of time. Some of them that shouldn't even be here. They don't know they're not supposed to be growing in Nebraska and yet here they are. So we're gonna have fun collecting and planting those. Here are just a few targeted species to think about. I will always hang my hat on oaks. Nebraska has seven native varieties, but there are many more across the region. Like I said, at least 30 probably we can grow in Nebraska. Burr oak would be at the top of my list. It's a wonderfully long lived tree. Right behind it, I would say chinkapin oak. We should plant the snot out of chinkapin oak. It's just a way woefully underutilized native tree. Other oaks to think about, and especially in Western Nebraska, gamble oak and buckley oak, they're heat tolerant, cold tolerant, and drought tolerant. Here's one of my favorites, the pecan tree. I love me some pecan pie, and so you can't have pecan pie without pecan trees, but pecans are really great shade trees, and they're gonna be a great substitute for green ash going forward. Black cherry, grow a black cherry. I'm, oh my gosh, do they do a lot of good for birds and wildlife. They're beautiful spring, summer, and fall. And we don't plant any black cherries, but we plant 48 million of those calorie pear trees from China. We've got that backwards. Elm trees, elm trees can come back to us now that we've figured out disease resistance of many varieties of American elm. Let's plant them again. And in some ways, it's easier to think about what not to plant. We literally can plant over 300 species or hybrids in Nebraska. So what do we talk about planting? Let's just say, start by this and say, quit planting the ones that are overplanted or that are invasive, especially ornamental pear, Russian olive, golden rain tree, tree of heaven and mulberry, cork tree. And then I would say the Freeman maples that are good trees, but they're overplanted. So... Uh, let's start working on diversity. And then as I wrap up, let's just show you a few trees and some of the, I would call the heroes of the people <laughs> that have planted and cared for these trees. Uh, this old uh, adage that if you see a, a turtle on a fence post, it didn't get there by accident. And so many of our best trees in Nebraska didn't get here by accident. Somebody planted them. Here's a champion 115 foot tall pin oak, state champion in Lincoln. Uh, the current owners are Brett and Lisa Gengenbach. And they could trace that tree's origin back to when the house was built. And I thought they said that it was right around 1915 or 1920. That tree could have gone away anyway along this, uh, especially homeowners that wouldn't want it falling on their house, but here it is. So how about the state champion Siberian elm on the right here? Uh, this is uh, Greg and Mary Wicklett out in Cozad. 
I'm not a big fan of Siberian elm, but thankfully uh, their, her uh, father-in-law planted that about 80 years ago, and now they have wonderful big old trees on their farm. Doak Nickerson, Bruce Hoffman, John Morganson, and Greg Morganson. These are all tree people in Nebraska that have done yeoman's work for planting trees and figuring out trees. Greg here is actually retired from North Dakota State University, and he has helped hybridize trees that are going to be great for our shifting climates going forward. John Morganson has helped plant thousands of trees in our state parks. They're really a, a treasure trove of great tree resources. Bruce Hoffman owns a nursery in McCook, and he, he, <laughs> He's not in it to make money, he keeps reminding me. He loses a lot of money, but boy, is he a strong tree advocate and doing great for Southwest Nebraska. And then Doak Nickerson is a forester, Nebraska Forest Service forester in the Panhandle, uh, caring for our native Pinelands, but also works with every community out there. And those guys have uh, left a legacy of tree planting and education you can't shake a stick at. I like these two guys, Noah Day and Jeff Kennedy out in Goffenburg at Lake Helen Park. There was a green ash tree that years ago kind of split over and fell over. And it's a great climbing tree for the kids. So Jeff said, let's do that in another part of the park with some of these chinkapin oak. He's gonna bend them over and let them grow like that ash tree did so that kids can climb them. Holy cow, let's, let kids climb trees. Let's encourage them to be close to trees and up in trees. Gilman Park Arboretum up in Pierce is where Gary Zimmer established a world-class arboretum. He suffered a stroke a couple years ago and had to retire. He was in the park caring for his trees and he suffered a stroke. He's doing fine now, but boy, did he plant a legacy. 350 different species and varieties of trees and shrub up in little old Pierce, Nebraska, north of Norfolk. This guy and the trees he, he's been a part of really are both our heroes, in my opinion. And then this Eastern Cottonwood, Populus deltoides. This is a Cottonwood, a wit, what we would call a witness tree. Uh, it was it's considered a sacred tree now to the Lakota, having witnessed the Battle of Blue Water, they think in 1855. We were out there this summer. I see George Ocker uh, on tonight. That was a wonderful event. We had George out at Ash Hollow. We got to go see this witness tree. And you can see how many of us it took to get around the tree holding hands. That's a huge tree, 150 to 175 years old. Um, and it says a lot about the culture and the happenings in uh, settlement times of Nebraska. Uh, we didn't treat the Lakota very well. And so thankfully we have a tree like that to stand in kind of sacred honor uh, to what that tribal group went through. So in summary, I can't read <laughs> that top of that, but here's what I would say to wrap up. Plant more trees indeed, but the right tree in the right place, properly planted and managed. Emphasize native species and exclude invasive less scattering of trees and more communal groupings wherever we can. Beyond trees, we need to strive for biodiversity using more native plants, celebrating insects, birds, and other wildlife. Remember that we're a prairie state, so let's honor our prairie right along with our trees. Rethink and rebrand what a healthy lawn looks like. Let's be water wise by slowing, conserving, and capturing that precious precious uh, life fluid <laughs> that we all need to sustain ourselves. Improve and sustain soil health. We've got to practice more nutrient recycling. Grow some food. Let's grow food in our landscapes and trees are a part of that. And then donate to organizations doing good work. If you can't do much of it yourself, you can give to good organizations that are doing good work. I'll put a plug in for the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum, but there are many others. There's Nature Conservancy, there's uh, uh, Wachiska Audubon. Any Audubon group is good. Uh, they're out there. So let, Arbor Day Foundation, let's help people do good by that uh, giving wherever we can. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up, take that off, hopefully. 
I will stop sharing that. And we're back. You all survived that. Justin, we already have a question in the chat. So I'll share that with you to yes, let's start ask it on questions. questions. This comes from Joe Francis. And he'd like to hear your take on the emerald ash borer, wondering if treatment is worth it. They have a couple in their front yard that do save us money in air conditioning, but what about the ash borer? Yeah, Joe, good question. Emerald ash borer can be treated. And so, yes, there are very um, usable and effective chemical treatments to, to help save your ash trees. There's emamectin and um, I forget the other chemical. Uh, imamectin will last two to three years, so you don't have to treat it every year. Um, so yes, there, you're gonna wanna, if it's a big tree, you're gonna wanna hire a certified arborist to do that, that knows what they're doing. Don't just go to Home Depot and buy something and inject it in your tree. That's not gonna get it done. Now, yes, you're putting an insecticide up into that tree. It's not gonna discriminate against what it kills. It's gonna kill any wood boring uh, worm or insect in that tree. But we have to value that or balance that with the loss of that tree. That's also an ecological loss, bird habitat and all of that. So it's uh, that's a long way around to saying, if you wanna save your trees, you can. There's ecological value in them to do that but a lot of people are choosing not to because they don't want to mess with uh, putting that herbicide out in the landscape. And the other issue there is we can probably only treat them right now for about 10 years uh, before we do too much wounding damage to the tree. And so um, there's kind of a, a rate of return there that doesn't pencil out forever. I hope that helps. Another question from Steve Schaefer. Will hybridized trees support native insects and birds? Oh. Hey, Steve, yeah, good question. Hybridized trees, and there are all kinds of hybridized trees out there. I'm trying to think maybe what would be, here's <laughs> something to think about. Almost every oak you plant, oaks love to have sex. Sorry about for the adult uh, <laughs> conversation here, but oak trees share genes all the time. And any of those oaks in the white oak group, they often hybridize with each other. So you see gradations of oaks and sometimes they have uh, hybridized vigor and they're doing really good work for uh, sustaining wildlife. Now, if it's non-native species that are hybridized and we see a lot of that going on in the nursery industry, I'd be less inclined to that. Uh, one thing I will say, if you're after an ornamental tree, I beat up on calorie pear ornamental pear trees are a problem. Let's quit planting them. But crab apples, they are not native necessarily to North America. There are 400 to 500 uh, hybridized varieties of crab apple or apple. But what we're seeing is they are not invasive plants. And we actually do have native malus species in North America. So it's fair to say, instead of an ornamental pear, I'm gonna plant a crab apple and they do a lot more good for insects, birds, and wildlife of all kinds. So you can feel good about that. I hope, and then I mentioned cherries, all of our native cherries, choke cherry, black cherry, pin cherry, go wild with the cherries and the, and the crab apples. Bertha asks what happened to the chestnut trees in Arbor Lodge? The chestnut tree, yeah, that's too bad. The chestnut tree was the most dominant tree in Eastern uh, North American forests until the early 1900s when chestnut blight came along and wiped out billions of trees, huge trees, uh, way bigger than you can imagine. They said a, a squirrel could hop on a chestnut tree in Maine and go all the way to Georgia on the boughs of chestnut trees. That's how thick they were. <laughs> that's probably not accurately true, but that's what they said. And then Nebraska uh, Arbor Lodge had a nice grove of chestnut tree, American chestnuts for a lot of years. They don't think it was actually blight that got to them, but just old age and uh, probably lack of genetic diversity, a little bit of that. Um, I personally, I used to be a, a fan of American chestnut. I'll be honest with you. I don't think they're a long-term solution to plant a whole lot of. And here's where I gotta be a little careful. 
There is this thing called the Chinese chestnut. It's easier to grow in Eastern Nebraska. And it does look like it's a close enough relative to our American chestnut. It's to say it's okay. You can plant that Chinese chestnut. There are hybridized varieties now and you don't feel bad about that. The good news about American chestnut is they've done a lot of hybridizing and genetic work on it and it's coming back. It'll be back. It won't be the numbers it was at one time, but it'll be back in our future. Nancy Flutter encourages people to become master gardeners, uh, get that training, or at least consult with a master gardener to help with selection and planting. Yes, <laughs> master gardeners are phenomenal. And I'm not Judith. a master gardener. I'm a pretty bad gardener, but. Uh, <laughs> I love those master gardeners. Judith says that uh, Lincoln Electric is cutting down 28 trees on her property. She has a, a one and a third acre and wants to know how to improve her yard to help save the wildlife. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm actually a pretty big fan of Lincoln Electric. They've got a big challenge to do. Keep, and after this week learning about power outages here in the Pigeon Forge area, trees come down on power lines. And unfortunately we gotta uh, manage that. So sometimes trees go away that we wouldn't want to. LES does a lot of good planting trees and supporting community tree planting. So I'll put a plug in for them. But yes, uh, right, that sucks that you lost trees uh, by Lincoln Electric's cutting them down. Lincoln Electric doesn't suck but it sucks that you lost those trees. How can you improve my yard to help save the wildlife? Did they come down because they were too big and into the lines? If so, plant smaller species, think more shrubby species. And boy, there are, uh, you're gonna learn coming up. There are dozens of things that we can be planting. Our native tree, sh uh, shrubby trees like viburnums I mentioned, crab apple, dogwoods, uh, wow, those are all cherries, choke cherry. Those are great for wildlife. I see we got a suggestion for hazelnuts. Yep, hazelnuts are really terrific. And how can you improve your yard to help save the wildlife? Here's one thing I encourage everybody to do. Uh, your neighbors might not like this, but in your backyard, be wild. Let, a, let the corner go wild or 10 feet along the fence allow a little bit of wildness to occur, right? Right, George, you're a wild man. So uh, let a little wildness happen in that backyard and you'll get more wildlife, even if it's weedy wildness. Uh, that's better than uh, trimming the grass to an inch of its life every single day of the year. Of course, try to use more native plants in that wildness. Uh, if you let it go, you're gonna get native weeds. <laughs> mare's tail and ragweed and things like that are actually really good for wildlife. Your neighbors won't want them, but uh, it's something to think about. Dale Minter has a question here. Do you see that, Justin? Okay, who is a contact in Lincoln to help make a decision on managing our suburban trees for the future? Yeah, the Lincoln uh, Parks Department has the forestry office within it, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Lori Gruber, <clears throat> excuse me, is our city forester. And I'm not telling you to call her directly or anything, but that's an office to call um, if you have concerns or suggestions. And then Lincoln has a tree board. Um, you can get online and look up who is the chair of the tree board. My cohort, Kendall Wires from the Nebraska Forest Service is on the Lincoln tree board. He'd take your phone call. Uh, have your voice heard, be active. The, Tree board meetings are open to the public. That's what they're about. So don't hesitate to contact the Parks Department or make your voice heard if you've got questions or concerns. <clears throat> the, it's a tough challenge, it is. Lincoln does, I'll tell you this, for as big a city as Lincoln is, Lincoln does a pretty darn good job of managing its urban forests. They take ownership in public trees. Most cities do not because they don't want the cost of dealing with a right-of-way tree. So Lincoln tries to honor that and there's only so much they can do with pressured budgets and all of that. So I don't wanna make an excuse for anybody, but we as citizens have a voice in that. And if we think the city should work harder 
at, at urban forestry management, let's make our voices heard. It's definitely gonna be critical to our climate future. I had my eye on the clock here and it looks like it's time for us to wrap up. Justin, I wanna thank you for such a, an inspiring presentation. You've, uh, you've shared a lot of uh, wonderful things for us to be pleased about with trees and also a lot of concerns. And I appreciate the enthusiasm that you have shared and I think have given us some things that uh, definitely we can apply in increasing our appreciation of trees and to help us be more effective advocates for the trees in our yard and in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laurel. It was a great pleasure to be here tonight. Go plant a tree, everybody. Thank Maybe you. not tomorrow, but this spring. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank everyone who set aside time tonight to consider the importance of trees, especially given the climate changes we're experiencing. I want you to be sure to tune again again next week at this same time. We'll be hearing from Sarah Browning of the Extension Service, Bob Henriksen of the Nebraska Forest Service and Statewide Arboretum, and Kayla Kaylin Neverv of the Lincoln Parks Department. And they're going to be talking more about Lincoln's need for healthy trees and share their tips about how to select trees uh, appropriately and plant and care for trees in our Eastern Nebraska climate. So they will be a, a perfect follow-up to the things that Justin has been talking about tonight. Meanwhile, I'd encourage you to check the Faith to Forest website and Lori has put those addresses in the chat. Uh, scroll up to the very beginning of the chat box and you'll find the address for our, our website and Facebook page to learn more about Faith to Forest and access a whole array of resources and find the latest updates on the Faith to Forest activities. It's been good tonight to have the Wachiska Audubon chapter with us and I'll remind those Wachiska members to stay online for a brief meeting after we sign off from Justin's presentation. And in parting, it's an old saying, but it's worth repeating. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. So I hope you're making some plans. Good night.